parents, when you sign up for these loans, it's going to be called the parent direct loan or the parent plus loan. Um, the student loans are referred to as the Stafford loans. So really the first step in this whole process, if you haven't done so already, is in the college portal. So whichever school you've committed to, under the financial aid tab of that portal, they have your uh, award summary where you can accept or decline your financial aid. Um, go ahead and accept all of the financial aid in there. Now, when you accept the financial aid in the actual school portal, it does not obligate you that you you have to take out the loans. So even if you need some time to think about it, if you don't want to sign up for them, really the first step is just to kind of put everything into play is through the school portal. Go ahead and accept all of the financial aid. That will start to trigger this process in, into what I'm going to show you here. Um, the first payment to the colleges usually are in August. So when that first payment um, needs to be made, we'll already have this loan set up so that when the loan or when the first payment becomes due from the school in August, the, the college will automatically communicate with your loan servicer. And I'll explain what that is in a second. So that automatically those funds get dispersed to the university. You've never received the actual proceeds of the loan yourself. It's a direct conduit between the college and the um, federal government that has the loan processing. So as we sign up for these online, you're, it's kind of like online banking where you can go online, check your balance of any loan disbursements. Um, if you want to start doing your loan repayment, you can start doing that as well um, on the student gov site that I'm going to share with you. And then with these loans, you have three options. Um, the first option would be if you wanted to start making payments right away, you could do that. So you can actually, um, as soon as it gets dispersed, then you can set up with your loan servicer uh, a payment plan. And remember that these loans are amortized over 10 years. So if we were to take out a loan um, this year in 2023, it'll have to be, the balance would have to be paid off by 2033. Same thing happens each year. So if we borrow again next year, 24, then the 10 year period will end in 34. Now the three payment options would be either you could start making principal and interest payments right away if you want to. Um, you can make interest only payments or you can do what's called a deferment. A deferment means as long as your student is enrolled in 12 units, considered um, more than part-time, then you can actually defer all of the payments until after the student graduates from college. Um, completely up to you. Just know that there's something called capitalization of interest. <laughs> I'm gonna just share like a few key terms with you throughout this webinar. Um, really what that means is if you do defer the payments and not make anything while the student's in school, that's fine. Um, just know that you're gonna be charged interest. Um, and then usually capitalization of interest means that you're, you're paying interest on top of interest. So. It's not a bad thing if the family wanted to maybe start making a little bit of progress and scratching away at the balance. You could start making some interest payments if you like. Um, <laughs> so those are the, the main kind of factors that I just wanted to go over before I jump in. Um, so again, remember, parents, you have your own FSA ID. You'll be um, signing up for the parent direct loan. And then students have their own FSA ID that they'll be signing up for the Stafford loan. Um, and then just to make sure everyone's clear, for the Stafford loan portion, which is the student loan, there is no co-signer. So parents, you're not signing on that loan. It's literally just in the student's name and they promise to pay that back once they graduate. Um, the Stafford loan for the first year is $5,500, okay? In some of your cases, depending on your reward package, that $5,500, $3,500 of it could be a subsidized loan, which basically means that the government is not charging any interest on that $3,500, <laughs> bless you. If anybody, uh, if you don't have a subsidized loan and it's just called unsubsidized Stafford loan, 
um, that really just means that um, it, there is going to be an interest rate accruing on that. So $5,500 for the first year. Next year as a sophomore, it goes up by increments of 1,000. So 6,500 and then 7,500 and 7,500 for the last Otherwise, year. So there's something called an endorser. So if let's say we're, for whatever reason, the parents can't qualify for the loan themselves, for the parent direct loan, then they can actually get an endorser, which is basically just a co-signer that will help you apply for that loan as well. So um, if this is the case, after you do try to sign up parents for the loan and you get the notification that um, for some reason you didn't qualify, then um, endorser would be your default option. Make sure that you sign in um, to the school portal, accept all of your financial aid first. Next step is you're gonna come to this website that I have here, um, studentaid.gov. Now, when you log in, I'm logged in as a parent at the moment, you're gonna come here, it's gonna give you your, um, the main frame uh, page where it shows like any balances, anything that you have currently. And you're also gonna have a servicer once you sign up for these loans and the loan, the first loan gets dispersed to the school, you're gonna notice that you have a servicer assigned to you. Um, this could be Nelnet, it could be uh, a few different names. Sometimes the, the federal student aid um, has their own department that does this. This one, it happens to be Advantage. Um, so this is the person that you're always gonna contact if you have questions about repayment, um, something called forbearance, if you need a little bit of an extension before you start making your payments back. Anything that has to do with the repayment of this loan, this is the entity that you're going to contact. It's called your loan servicer. And so that everybody will have their own. Um, because we've already completed the FAFSA form, that was kind of the first step to initiate this, the student and parent loans. Then what you're going to do, we're going to come here to loans and grants. And notice here on the left-hand side, we have plus loans, grad plus and parent plus. So um, parents, you are going to do this step in conjunction with the master promissory note and loan entrance counseling. The only two steps that the students will take is the loan entrance counseling and the master promissory note. So they will not have to do the grad plus or the parent plus uh, application. What I'm going to start with here is loan entrance counseling. So this has to be done in order for the, the um, loan to get dispersed. And what I'm doing here is we're going to indicate I am an undergraduate student. I am a graduate or professional student. So all of us would be going in the first one here. So I'm an undergraduate student. And it's going to give you an overview here. In this case, the student is at USC. So it's going to just ask for the university and which and select that. You can definitely just do search for a school, enter it there. Okay. So once we select the school, estimate the cost of your education. This will really be the starting point here. So we're going to go over the they want to make sure that you're aware of the total amount of loans that you're going to need throughout the four years of education, type of school, living arrangement, we're going to say on campus here, expected years, we're going to say four. And so what it's telling you is over the course of the years with the current cost of attendance, what that eventual cost may look like with no financial aid. So if you were just borrowing the full amount. Now this is gonna give you, it's almost like an open book test. So before they ask you a series of questions, they're expecting that you're going to review this information in order to um, accurately answer the loan entrance counseling questions. So just be, um, be in the know here. It's talking about what does it mean to have a principal and an interest in loan fees. Differences between federal student loans, private student loans. Um, by the way, just so you know, um, as you look for these, most banks don't do consolidation loans, which means that you have multiple loans as you go through this educational process. Usually banks don't consolidate to get a lower interest rate. Um, some, a lot of the times students will do that through the federal loan program. So again, it's just another reason to kind of compare and contrast um, the different types. How federal loans work. 
and how it's determined. And it's also just explaining kind of the, um, the binding agreements that you have. Now, these loans, families, when you do sign up for them, these are not the kind of loans that can ever be discharged through bankruptcy. You can't walk away from these loans. If there ever is a loan forgiveness program, hopefully, I don't know, um, then some loans could be forgiven. Um, however, when these loans do get assigned to you and they get dispersed, they're the hardest loans to ever walk away from. It's almost impossible. So just be cognizant of that as you sign up for these loans. Okay, student loan program, current interest rates. Okay, so uh, on the direct subsidize, five and a half percent. On the direct unsub, current loan amount fee, and when payments are required, six months after graduation. Um, remember, like I said, the subsidized loans during the time that the student is in school, there's a zero percent interest. Now, once the loan becomes due after they graduate, then there will be um, interest accruing at that time. Differences between the direct and the um, subsidized and unsubsidized. Now, aggregate limit. So if your student ends up taking more than four years to finish, they can get more from the loan program. Hopefully, you are finishing in four years. independent and undergraduate students. So for the purposes of um, the undergrad, the student will always be considered a dependent student. Once the student graduates from undergrad and let's say they go beyond and get a master's degree, for example, then they will then become considered an independent. And parents, you are no longer uh, obligated to sign up for any of these loans uh, to pay for college. The student will be independent, but right now they're considered dependent. How PLUS loans could help you close the gap. Just kind of some basic information. Current interest rate on the PLUS loan that did go up since the last time I checked is 8%. Now there's a loan fee. So what that means is there's an initiation fee when you do sign up for this loan, the, the part of that loan packaging, and they'll put it into the balance. You're not paying out of pocket, but they, they have an initiation fee to get these loans, 4.228. These are just the steps on how to um, do that. We've just talked about this already. Um, how you'll receive the loan money, like I said, it usually goes directly to the school. Um, there are some cases, families, where let's say that additional funds are needed beyond what the school costs. In, and those cases could be, maybe the student needs a car uh, to tra for transportation or they need some a, a loan to get some uh, laptops or whatever that is. There are some cases where you can actually apply for additional parent loan money. It has to get approved. Um, if it's absolutely necessary, then maybe you could think about doing it, but there is something called an overage where you can ask a little bit more beyond the school direct fees where you can use that for um, school related purposes like laptops or anything that's related to the education. I don't always suggest that, but if it's a hardship scenario, just know that you can do that. Talking about your loan servicer, and this has everything to do with um, any payments that you're gonna make, you're gonna speak with the loan servicer. Um, now it's gonna check our knowledge. I'm gonna walk you through these uh, the Q&A so that you could always review this later when you're um, viewing the recording. You can literally have this on simultaneously as you're going through your process. So you can kind of key in on what I'm sharing with you right now. Um, what document explains your rights and responsibilities as a federal loan borrower? You're going to say your master promissory you note. Know? Which loan type provides interest subsidy, meaning Department of Education pays your interest while in school? If you remember, we said the direct subsidize. Who should you contact if you have trouble making payments? It's always going to be your loan servicer. Let me see if I can bypass this so we don't always have to put in this. It'll probably want us to do it. I think so. Yeah. All right. So degree type, we're going to say bachelor's degree and field of study. Uh, 
it's just the English one. Total amount I may borrow. Um, let's just say program length. We're going to say four years. Okay. Again, very basic math. Now, when you, I'm going to walk you to this next page, you can actually specify an exact amount that you want to sign up for if you like. If you, let's say, have an idea that you want to make payments to the school, um, but you also want to utilize the loan funds so that you don't have to pay the full amount out of pocket, you could definitely do that. Um, so you could specify a specific amount that you want to borrow, or you can also just indicate, I want to borrow the full amount that's needed for the year of education. Um, and then the loans get dispersed per semester or per term. So it's not just one direct payment to the school for the entire year. Student loan interest accrues. They're talking about um, capitalization of interest, like I was mentioning earlier. Talking about what some of the benefits would be if you can um, pay the interest as it accrues versus deferring. Um, could you contact if you already accept more loan money than you need? In this case, I would actually see your school's financial aid office to see if that's correct. Right. What increases your total loan balance? Interest accrual, int uh, interest capitalization, both interest rates are both of those. Uh, how can you reduce your total loan costs? Make interest payments while in school, make interest and principal payments while in school, make interest and principal payments. Um, during the grace period, any of the above. How do you pay um, servicer? When does payment to your servicer begin? Like I was mentioning, you have the different options. Um, and in this case, for this particular family that I'm logged in for, um, this is their servicer, but everybody will have a different one. Okay. Estimated monthly payment amount once the student graduates. Payment plan reminders, what you need to know, like I was talking about different types. Now, this is interesting, something worth knowing. There's a standard repayment plan, which means that it's kind of a fixed amount throughout the whole duration of the loan. There's a graduated repayment, so sometimes Families will opt for this once it becomes time to pay for their loan, um, where kind of first starting off in the career, they're not the student's not going to earn as much. So we may want the loan payments to be a little bit lower starting off. And then as you get more and more established and you're starting to earn a little bit more income towards the tail end of the loan, the payments become a little bit larger in order to pay off that full balance. So that's just called a graduated payment. Um, and then pay as you earn. So kind of just based on what your um, annual salary is. Um, who do you contact if you have questions about repayment plans? Again, this would be your loan servicer. Who do you contact when it's time to enroll in a repayment plan? What percentage of your gross salary does the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau suggest your student loan payment be in order to be affordable and limit the risk of delinquency or default? No more than 8%. Which repayment plan will you be placed on automatically unless you change it by contacting the servicer? So remember what we were just talking about. They're always going to start you on a standard repayment plan. What happens if you miss payments? Kind of basic um, stuff, family. So delinquency and default. Wage garnishment. Believe it or not, and this actually does happen, I've seen... Scenarios where families have actually had their wages garnished or they've taken the tax refund away if they're delinquent on payment. So that's what I'm saying. These loans are just um, be be aware that we cannot discharge them. In certain industries, um, for example, in certain teaching, uh, for uh, there are certain loan forgiveness programs that, depending on the industry, um, you could also sign up for. 
Um, but usually it does require you to make a certain number of payments back to your loan on time without missing any. And then after a certain period of time, you can get the remaining balance forgiven. Um, so there are some things to look for, especially if you're going into um, specific industries. So something to look for. Right. And then I'm not going to submit this yet because I don't want to do this for the family and submit it, but I just did want to show you the master promissory note. Or I'm sorry, the, the loan entrance counseling. Now what I'm going to do is show you the master promissory note. Um, remember when I was mentioning parents, you're signing up for your own loan. Students, you're going to log in, sign in for your own. Now, as I'm signed in right now as a parent, this is what I am going to click for the master promissory note. I'm a parent of an undergraduate student. Conversely, students, when you're logged in to sign up for your Stafford loan, you're going to um, select this one for the NPN. I am an undergraduate student. So just make sure that we're distinguishing between the two. So right now, as a parent, I'm going to click this. Okay, now here is where they're gonna ask for the student information. And I'm not gonna enter this in right now because obviously it's personal information. Um, but within the master promissory note families, they're going to ask you um, a series of these questions such as, do you want to specify a specific amount to, to borrow? Or it's also gonna give you a, an option to say, I'd like to borrow the full amount that's available to me. Um, the other thing that the master promissory note is going to ask for are references. These are a neighbor, a friend, a family member. Now, these are not people that are going to be on the loan, but they need a contact person in case they can't get in touch with you. So two people that the family knows with their information, um, they don't need any social security or anything like that, just contact info. So those are going to be two references that you're going to need. Um, and the agreements are basically just saying that you are agreeing that you are going to pay this back as you sign up for these loans and as they get dispersed. Um, there's no collateral on these loans. It's just basically it's tied to you and it'll be throughout the duration of that 10 year period. Um, after that, or even during, you can do a consolidation and find, um, lower interest rates. Hopefully, you know, in a couple of years, I don't. You know, if I had a crystal ball, I would definitely tell you, but hopefully their interest rates will be lower um, in a couple of years from now. So you could always look at re reconsolidating that um, and then get lower payments as well. So this is going to be um, that that process for everyone. And then parents, you, you have just one extra step, which is the plus loan uh, part of this. And then I'm a parent of a student. Okay. Now, when you do this, you're going to select the award year 2324. And then you're going to also indicate all of the students' personal information here indicate the university that this information is going to go to and then continue from there. Um, it's going to ask you um, just a few basic in, uh, questions. This is the probably the shortest section that you'll go through. Um, and then right at the end, when you review and submit, you'll have a confirmation page that pops up and it'll say you've been approved. All communication for the first payment goes directly from the university to the federal loan program and it gets sent directly to them. You as a family can always log in to your dashboard account and see if a payment's been dispersed. Um, the school portal is really useful as well where you can go on and see when payments from the loan has been um, adjusted to the balance um, and manage it from there. Really the, the main person that you'll ever be in contact with for this, um, if you need to make any payments, like I said, is the loan servicer. And that will get assigned to you once the first disbursement is made. Okay, question two part. Is the rate tied to a credit score? And is there any sort of uh, 
early payment penalty if you want to pay your loan off early? Great questions. Um, no, the rate is the same for everyone. It has nothing to do with your credit score. And um, there is no early payment penalty. You can pay these off early at, at any time. You're not penalized for that. Okay. And for us, when we have multiple children going at the same time, I guess we just have to fill out one at a time, each one. Okay. Correct. So each of the each of the students will have to do their own. And then for the parent loan portion of it, we will have to um, do one for each as well. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Trevor. Hello. Hi. Um, so I wanted to ask, in this particular university, they, they sent, they, this forms seem to be in the portal, but I still have to go to the FASA as well to answer both. Okay, I'm glad that you actually brought this up. Very good point. Um, there are some cases that for whatever reason, the university has not fully subscribed to the federal student loan loan counseling program. Um, so they may actually have within the school's portal their own really quick version of the loan counseling. So you'll notice that when you accept your financial aid in the school's portal, it'll say, okay, your next steps are to fill or to click on this link. If it doesn't lead you to the federal loan program, which is what I was just giving you as an overview, it's most likely that the school will have their own. Um, and that's probably what you're referring to, Barbara. Right. So, but I still have to go to the federal in order to, for the forms to be completed, correct? You will. Yeah. It, it may just have you bypass the, one of the steps because the school will have their own version of it. Um, but more than likely, you'll still do the master promissory note. Okay, so the next question is, um, if um, if they have given you a certain amount of money um, and it's substantial, but you don't want to take all that amount, how do you tell them, well, I don't want it all, but what if you end up needing some of that <laughs> offer? Later. So um, what you would do in that case, and I believe you're referring to the loan amount that they've approved before. Right. So if you did want to set up a direct, let's say payment with this with the university, they do, and you can specify to them, I'm going to make um, this amount of payments directly and the rest will come from the loan. Um, what How you would indicate that is when you do the master promissory note, It'll ask you, do you do you have a specific amount you'd like to borrow, or would you like to borrow the full amount? If you're in the middle of the school year, you happen to realize that you know what, I'd I'd want to change the amount of the loan, and I don't want to pay out of pocket. Um, the loan servicer could then adjust those amounts for you. Thank you. You're welcome. Trevor, question: If you have this go through this process, you have a loan at the end. But let's say I want to go for a, a, a private bank loan or something, I'll get a better interest rate or so. Does that interfere if I get another loan somewhere else? Which one will the university link up to after I've gone through this process with the government loan? Great question. Um, so you would actually, let's say you've secured the, the government loan first and then you later find the, the bank loan to be more advantageous. Um, you would you would notify the um, the loan servicer to then either put a stop or reduce the amount. I'd imagine you'd put a stop on the you find a better one. Um, and I would still communicate with the financial aid office, letting them know that you have an alternate route that will be funding that. Okay, so just work with the school and work with the loan servicer. That's correct, yeah. Okay, perfect, thank you. You're welcome. And can I ask, uh, Trevor, for, um, do they check, we've had to freeze all of our credit because of uh, identity theft. So um, they, well, do they look at one particular Experian, TransUnion, Equifax, do you know? Um, I want to say it's Equifax. Okay. However. I mean, I'm sure I can. Research. You could, um, 
because I know that for those credit freezes, you can you can ask for like a one day pause on that so that you can apply for the credit. Um, I just yeah. I, I don't want you to go through that whole process and then they're checking a different one, I guess. So how far in advance should you do this um, in comparison to the first payment due? Yes, good question. Um, if we could actually complete this no later than the end of July, that would be ideal. And then the next question is, let's say, okay, for instance, your kid qualifies, as you said, $5,500 of unsubsidized and subsidized. Thinking in terms of interest, you want to maybe split it between the let's say if you're on semester, each semester. So you would only take out, like for instance, maximize your subs, you know, your subsidized first and then take the unsubsidized the next semester. Melissa, I love how you think. This is good. Um, however, they do their own dispersion. So they'll actually just split it right in half. Um, and then the, the first half will go the first semester equally from the unsub and the subsidized. Okay, so you're applying at this time for the full year. Okay. Um, and then families, remember that this whole financial aid process um, is not just a one-year setup. It's We'll do the FAFSA again next year. Um, and then we'll still do this same process for the sophomore, junior, and senior year. So it's kind of, it's set, it resets to zero every year. Like I said, as long as you complete this, by the end of July, it's good timing. I know some parents, you're not a big fan of having the student sign up for a loan, but just because financially it makes more sense to get a lower interest rate. And even if you plan on paying it off yourself, um, have the student still take out the loan in their name only because it's a lower interest rate and it makes sense to do it that way. And like I said, there's no prepayment penalty. So if you decided to, hey, you get good grades, I'm going to pay this off early or whatever, you know, you can do that. When you look at the full breakdown of the cost for the year, there's the direct fees, which is the tuition, room and board. Those are the things that the college is actually billing you for. The other components are called indirect fees, meaning that the school does not charge you for that, but they're saying, hey, just be cognizant of as a total balance for the year, you might run into some of these other costs, like the personal fees. So those aren't things that the college is gonna bill you for. Um, so when you sign up for these loans, it's going to cover all the college costs minus any of like those personal expenses that, you know, going out and going into a restaurant or getting a haircut, things like that. 